It is as though we are still on a plantation. Anyone who thinks that slavery ended uh, in the 1860s with the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation are grievously wrong. Uh, slavery has been with us and continues to have its manifestations in a variety of ways. Imagine you and your family living in this barn, forced to live like animals and with animals. No heat, no electricity, none of the things we commonly take for granted. This is the case of one family, held as slaves up until the 1960s. We found this barn at Grange Hall Road and MS Highway 568 near Vicksburg, Mississippi, in July 2009. This is the true life story of former slave, May Louise Miller. Well, you know, I came from a very poor family, and we was uh, in slavery. We didn't have food, clothes, shoes. We really didn't have much of nothing. And the clothes we had was uh, a coca side. Each one of us had a coca side with three holes cut in it, and that was your clothes, your shirt, pants, and underclothes, or whatever you want to call it, dress. We had no shoes. We had uh, the kill what we eat. We didn't have a stove. We really didn't even have a house. We lived, laid on the grass, on the dirt. The hay was our bed, and we covered with the hay was our cover. We laid with snakes. We ate snakes. We ate the crickets. We ate the worms. We ate the birds. We ate the bird eggs. We ate the rabbits. We ate the frogs. We just, we were just kind of like Tarzan. But it was that come in front of you. That was your meal, if you caught it. And uh, that was our motto. It was more than me, but I don't call a name. But if we caught a worm, each one of us took a bite of that worm. If we took caught a cricket, although you think a cricket is dope, but we broke it into pieces that each one of us could have a piece of that cricket. If we caught a fish that done wash on the bank side, whatever, when we bit it, everybody took a bite. Okay. President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. 
by 1865, the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery, had become constitutional law in most states. And in 1865, Lincoln became the first U.S. president to be assassinated. During Reconstruction, most southern states ratified the 13th Amendment. However, they also put in place a series of laws that severely restricted the rights of African Americans called the Black Codes. Mississippi was the first state to institute the Black Codes, and its legislators didn't ratify the 13th Amendment until March 16, 1995. Johnny Thomas is mayor of Glendora, Mississippi. Thomas also grew up in slavery. Everybody else was in charge of you. That was a big part of me looking at how we had to go to uh, the, the owners to get anything. They had their own plantation uh, store. That's where we had to eat from. That's where my mom was always in debt. We never had anything, you know, growing up. That was a, that was a tough time. Now, what were you telling me about this area? Oh, well, I was just talking about this being a, a plantation type of community and uh, pretty much in the shape that it in because individuals hoped that it went back to, to the cotton field as such. What do you mean by plantation type? Well, we was created around plantations. This entire area here was pretty much farmers, and now they are pretty much mechanized and corporate farmers. Uh, therefore, leaving individuals here to fend for themselves and hopefully to keep uh, the status quo. When I say status quo, keeping individuals without. It is their mission, it seems, uh, that this community stay poor uh, as it was in the past. I'm a part of the Swan Lake. Uh, the Swan Lake community was owned by uh, the floats. And the floats owned the plantation in Swan Lake as well as in Glendora. In July of 2009, not only did we interview May Louise Miller, who was a former slave until the 1960s, but we uncovered a present-day plantation. We're concealing the identities of those living on this plantation to protect them from any repercussions. If you have housing in the city with you move, well, you would pay like $70 a month? Well, as long as it's around where I stay, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I can do that. You know, we couldn't get, it on, get them to say anything about the owners on camera, but uh, they, they explained to us off camera exactly what was going on and they said to us if we were able to get them off of the plantation that they would give us the full story on camera. Human rights activist and writer Dick Gregory explains the mentality of present day slavery. And so you sit and you look at a mentality and so when I looked at that film, I didn't think about my mother. They would bring my mother to the house. And when they bring my mother to the house, one of us would have to go with my mother, so the mouth was safe. And so this was the particular time that I had to go with my mom. So they raped my mom. And when it came to me, I was sitting there crying because, you know, I, you know, when you don't know what's going on, I was sitting up there crying. And, they, and so the lady said, they come coming to me. So the master's wife said, take him out. And the other brothers or whoever they were. And she said, and they was sort of looking, and she said, oh, no. No, honey, no. No. And she says, uh, she's not even a helper yet. I didn't learn what that word was to over in the 70s. And she said, she's not even a helper yet. She's just a yearly. You can't. But they gagged my mouth and they raped me just like they did my mama. 
and there I was laying in that pile of blood, a little bit of girl didn't know what to do. And his wife had to clean me up. But that never stopped. And uh, I remember telling my mom, if you go tell that old nigger what happened here today, we's going to kill everybody. We took this issue of present-day slavery, Penage, to Capitol Hill. We contacted members of Congress to get a reaction, but were not surprised when they said they would, but never set up a time to be interviewed. Radio talk show host George Wilson has been reporting from Capitol Hill for over 30 years. He's well known by every member of Congress and the Senate, but none of them would give him an interview on present-day slavery and or pinage either, even though they promised they would. We all had been led to believe that somehow we were past slavery and its vestiges and we were moving on to a better day. Well, seeing the footage that I saw and realizing that many of my brothers and sisters are living in not only abject poverty, but all the vestiges of slavery, it was saddening, uh, to say the least. And it really tells me that here on Capitol Hill, we have to have lawmakers talking about this very subject. This is not something that's going away anytime soon, and this matter needs to be addressed at the highest levels of the government. Why do you think it hasn't haven't been addressed? Because as, as you saw, in the, there are documents already at the Justice Department. What's going on? Well, it, it would take some what the lawmakers like to call heat from the streets. And I think there has to be an outcry among people to say, look, this is still going on. I have relatives who are living this way, or I know of situations like this. And we have to have hearings here on Capitol Hill about it. So I think it starts out with lawmakers knowing. And I was looking at Glendora, Mississippi, Glendora, Mississippi. And I'm almost certain that that's in Congressman Benny Thompson's district. Anytime you're talking about the Delta, you're talking about Benny Thompson. So when I see him today, I'm going to be sure to mention to him about what's happening in this district, ask him if he knows about it, and ask him if he intends to take the next step to see to it that we have congressional hearings about the condition that men, women, and children are currently existing under. I don't blame him on this. Different people got different levels. And so when I sit and I looked, and then you go back to the 13th Amendment, most folks really didn't read that right, especially black folk. But when you read it, here's what that 13th Amendment should have read like. Neither slave or indentured servitude. See, most folks don't know that there were more white folk slaves in America than black folk. Those white people on the plantation too? They just call them indentured servitude and they could buy their freedom every seven years. Probably the greatest movement in the history of the planet was the abolition movement. You had white folks willing to die to liberate men. Willing to kill to liberate me. I mean, think about that movement now. They're not, they're not fighting to liberate themselves or their family. They're not killing black folks. They're killing white folks. John Brown, him and his boys, his children. He, oh, he's crazy. He went up to Kansas and killed 13 white folks. No, no. Kansas was the state, first state that had death to the abolitionists. And so they hanged the first at that trial. And John Brown and his sons moved in there and killed people. The judge and the 12 jurors. They scared Kansas so bad they rescinded that law the next week. Uh, the abolitionist movement, you, you see no movement till up, up in New England. <clears throat> One of the sad things of Frederick Douglass' life, he died brokenhearted, 
because he wanted to be part of the abolitionary movement. And the abolitionists said, no, Negroes can be part of this movement because y'all too childlike. white folks willing to die for me? Kill other white folks for me? <laughs> but in their mindset, I'm too childlike. So you can't be part of this? You couldn't be part of it at all. And so when you, you, you stop and, and go back and then come forward, you see, it's never in our lifetime about racism or prejudice or segregation. It's about white supremacy, and most white folks don't even understand that. I remember one time my mama said, I was nine years old, yeah, the problem with America is these old ignorant, snuff-dipping, nigger-hating white boys can't read or write. I couldn't say too much for my mother, but she ignorant person when you try to tell them something, they'll jump on you if you're a child. So I say to my brother, she really believed that type of white person determined public power. You really believe some redneck, nigger-hating, snuff-dipping white boy that ain't never been to school determined public No, the problem is the president of Harvard and Yale and MIT, huh? The president of AT&T. We don't want to mess with them because they'll roll on you. So we pick on a little chump white boy like he's my problem. Fifth rider is, uh, let's say, for instance, I'm on your plantation. I may have did something, may not even know what I have did, but since you're the master, you knew I need killing. Something done went on, or something they thought went on, so they would get 50 people. And they call them 50 riders. And they go on, all meet up. They're going to come get that person. They had a tree. They would go and they would hang them. Well, every time I've seen them get together, they were finna kill somebody. And I, I, don't, I don't remember what the days, I don't know them about the 4th of July or this day. Uh, that day. We didn't know nothing about Fourth of July and stuff like that. But when they were, we all seen them get together, somebody would finna die. See, a hurricane is the spirit of a black woman. See, all hurricanes, not almost all, start right there in West Africa where the slaves was put on the ship. All hurricanes stay underwater and follow the same path that the slave ship was. No slave was offloaded to ship until it got to the Caribbean. No hurricane jumps above water until it gets to the Caribbean. Then it will hit this country, come all the way up this east coast. Most destructive where black women was most misused. And it goes all the way up to Maine. And for those of you who've never been to Maine, there's parts in Maine that Canada, you can just step over to it. And Canada's never had a hurricane. When they get to that, they just blow out. No, why? Because Canada never did to a black woman what America did. If you know who you are and who we are. And so when I look at this film and, and think about Thirteenth Amendment. You know, for those of y'all, the next time you go to Washington D.C., take your camera and go to the Lincoln Monument. Lincoln is known all over the world for the Emancipation Proclamation. You know how many people don't even know Lincoln was president? All they know about Lincoln is emancipate. If you go to the Lincoln Monument, there's not one word on that monument about the Emancipation Proclamation. Then you start seeing what we hooked up in. That viciousness, not one word. This huge monument, that huge. Not one word that says massive.
you pull a cotton out of the birds and you put them in a sack and you look like the roads don't never have an end to them. They be so long. You start like today and look like it'll take you a week before you get to the end of one row. And you have to be taking two rows at a time. You have to pick two or three rows at a time cutting across that. And you couldn't raise up picking the sky. You steady pick. If you raised up, you had somebody on a horse with a horse and a cow with it. And they'll pop you one time that cow with it. And blood's gonna flash your what and it's gonna be like you be beaten to death. Now, if you go back to the thirteenth amendment, here's what it should say. All slaves and indentured servants, as of this signing, is free. It don't say that. It says all slaves and indentured servitude, except, see, except, you see everybody missed that. Right after that, it said, except those who have been legally found guilty in a court of law. And then Section 2 of the 13th Amendment say Congress will have the power to enforce this legislation. They let the states enforce it until, what, 1947. This is the first time that Congress enacted legislation to enforce the 13th Amendment up until then. So let, let, let me make it real simple. I'm on the white man's farm. Massa, Kachipi. I'm free. He mad at you white folks that made him. And he mad at me. So then he says, to the sheriff, who's his brother, that nigga raped my wife. So I go to jail with hostile white folks, find me guilty. That's what the, that's what the 13 members say. Except if you've been convicted in a court of law legally. Now what happens? I go to jail, and every day you come by and check me out. I'm back at that same picking cotton for free. That's the 13th Amendment. There's loopholes in that. And now we wonder why today there's 2.5 million people in jail and 75% of them are parole violators and 89% of them are drug violators. I mean, if you arrest me for drugs and put me in jail and don't rehabilitate me and then let me out, you can bust me anytime you want me. That's the free labor. That's in the 13th Amendment. And so, when you stop and think about it, you know, listening to the woman and looking at the shack and, and, uh, and hearing her voice, and then you say, well, wait a minute. Could that same white dude keep terrorists there or Russian spies or the KGB and the government wouldn't know it? No. So it's just a matter of people turning their back on it. I mean, you can go in there and show me this film, but the Justice Department don't know this exists. Come on. You really be that nice? When we was... Uh Coming up, well, when I was coming up, you know, we didn't, like I said, we didn't have kibble, we didn't have blankets, we didn't have pillows and stuff, but we had a dad, and he would lay in the dirt, and he was our pillow to keep our face out of the dirt. 
and we didn't have enough hay to lay out. I was raped at an early age. I said maybe before I was five, about the age of five, that I got raped many times by these owners of us. And we was beaten. On a daily basis, not one time, but many times. You went in the field before the sun come up. You came out the field after the sun go down. But if any event that it was dark nights and the moon came out. You didn't lay on that hay or on that dirt or that sand pile or whatever you had to lay on. You had to get up, go back to the field and pick your cotton by the moonlight. So it just wasn't no rest for us at all. It wasn't no rest at all. Not at all. If we caught a rabbit, we ate through the heart and ate the rabbit. If we caught a bird, we ate through the feathers and ate the bird. We didn't have nothing to cook on. We didn't have no stove or nothing like that. And they carried us, like I said, from one plantation to another. At this time, I don't know how to recognize time back in that time. But they would take a big old tub, we call it a wash tub now, and they would take all that stuff from the table that they eat from, and they would break it in this tub. If it was tea, if it was water, if it was grits, if it was beans, if it was light bread or bits or whatever, and when they thought they had enough in that tub for us to eat a meal, that would be our meal. They would take it out under the tree and say, uh, come on, you niggers. We have y'all some food now. Come on. Time for you to eat. We didn't know no better. We didn't know what spoons was. Our hands and our mouth was our spoon. And we all would get off in that sour stuff. We didn't even have such stuff to know it was sour. World-renowned legal author, presidential advisor, and Harvard law professor, Charles Ogletree. Uh, President Lincoln's effort to free the slaves came after a real conflict that he had. Uh, he said uh, in his thoughts about slavery, uh, that he would either be for slavery or against slavery. It depended on what would support the Union. Uh, thank God that the, uh, the, the great uh, Civil War was actually won uh, so that uh, there would be an end to slavery, but it didn't happen then. Uh, and what we have found uh, in the 20th century and the 21st century, the continued vestiges of slavery from the, the 17th and 18th uh, and 19th century. Why? That's because we didn't have policies that really made the South, in particular, understand its responsibility to follow the law, to treat people as equal, to give them basic rights. And new forms of slavery popped up, uh, not only with the uh, involuntary servitude of uh, people of African descent, but with a system, a government-sanctioned and authorized system of separation uh, that didn't allow blacks to sleep at a hotel, didn't allow them to vote, didn't allow them to eat at a restaurant, uh, didn't allow them to drink at a water fountain unless it was marked colored. Uh, and we know legends uh, 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 of stories of people traveling from 
uh, north to the south uh, and never explained to their children why they packed uh, a week's worth of food because they couldn't eat in a restaurant, why they drove past restrooms because their kids couldn't uh, uh, use the uh, bathroom and, and toilets that were reserved for whites, why they couldn't drive on certain highways uh, because they would be the victims of all sorts of harassment uh, and even death, uh, as we saw. And so the issue of slavery is a stain, uh, a very serious stain on American culture, uh, and it has not been removed, and it may not be removed. We asked the young lady, who we'll call Lauren, how long she had been living there. She told us that her family had been living there for generations. Oh, well, I'm 33. Back there, about 13 years. I've been here about like 13 years. I say about 6, 7 years, recently. stay. Yeah, I've but to gain access to the property, the crew had to pretend to be charity workers, delivering toys and clothing to the children. It was hard to get the adults to talk about the owner or landlord. Who owns all this land? So you may ask, why don't they just leave? Does the word conditioning come to mind? People are going to look at this and say, why did you run away? You ain't ran away. You ain't gone back to Africa, white racist system. That ain't never liked you. Two PhDs and ain't left nowhere. We wanted to learn more about the people of the Mississippi Delta. So we spoke with Cassandra of Marks, Mississippi. Cassandra explains that her grandmother was an outright slave until the early 2000s. My grandmother did pick time. She worked for the white folks, so to speak, till she was like 75. She just, she was bonded to them until they died. She was their slave, like, bonded. So, she still had to work with them. She, till they died or till she died. What years is that? Are you talking she was born about? in 1918. So. She was bonded until she died? She was bonded until she died. She died in 2003. Cassandra lived in just a shell of a house. There was only one room that her, her son, and her boyfriend could live in. They used a hot plate for a stove, and the electrical wiring was so bad that when they used the hot plate, they couldn't use any other electrical device. Got to unplug everything, then cook on the hot plate, because the breaker going to jump everything off. Got to unplug everything, then cook on the hot switch keep breaking on and off so it's just like ain't got no air there weren't any walls they had uh some had paneling on it and some didn't so and the paneling was all broken up so we just took it down i know that we're still on a big plantation in the sense that uh this place was pretty much destined to go back to plantation because of its infamous history and when you physically go down to that part of the country and you see the, this vast amount of land that's being controlled by a few people, you realize it's hundreds and hundreds of miles away from anybody, and they can basically just do what they want. It's like a good old boys club. And uh, just as money, money in Mississippi now, back to the plantation. Once we were allowed inside one of the shacks they call home, it was like being inside an oven. The walls had black soot crawling all over them, and in the sink. It was difficult to film because we had to watch where we stepped because the floor had holes in it that led directly to the ground. And when I call slave, it's, it's the individual actually, they could not leave the plantation because they owed or were uh, somehow the, the penal system gave the, the boss man authority over these individuals and left them in the system as long as they stayed with this plantation. Or the threat was there that if they left this plantation, then, you know, you're going to prison. So these people just lived there forever and ever. You know, we, we had a step fetching. It was one of the smartest guys it was, but he came in on a train, and they got him off the train, and he had to stay there. And he, as a matter of fact, he died there uh, at the uh, Swan Lake Plantation. And, I think he was an educator or something from way since he came. But we never could find out anymore because somehow he got here and got stuck and they didn't
not let him get away from it. And not only him, uh, there are others that I knew was there, uh, had gotten in some trouble with the law, and the law passed them on to the plantation. And it was an old form of the penal system where right across the bayou here, we actually had a penal system on the Frederick plant. And Frederick in town. Article 10, Section 225. Placement of convicts on state farms, prison industries, reformatory schools, good behavior. The legislature may place the convicts on a state farm or farms and have them worked thereon or elsewhere. It may also provide for the creation of a nonprofit corporation for the purpose of managing and operating a state prison industries program which may make use of the state prisoners in its operation. It may establish a reformatory school or schools and provide for keeping of juvenile offenders from association with hardened criminals. December 19, 1990. Article 10, Section 226. Hire or lease of county jail inmates. Convicts sentenced to the county jail shall not be hired or leased to any person or corporation outside of the county of their conviction after the first day of January, 1893, nor for a term that shall extend beyond that date. What makes all of this so interesting is that people need to go back and think about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. While the 13th Amendment was designed to end slavery, uh, it really didn't uh, comprehensively do that. And in fact, if you look at the language of the 13th Amendment, and uh, a dear colleague, Professor Doug Colbert, has written extensively about the 13th Amendment uh, as giving certain rights to a formerly disenfranchised, powerless people. And in fact, uh, the 13th Amendment should be viewed not just as ending slavery, but empowering those who are victims uh, of the system of of slavery that uh, uh, gripped this country and created this economy uh, for centuries. Before the 13th Amendment was passed. And the same thing with the 14th and 15th Amendment, designed to create equal protections of the laws and basic citizenship rights. Those things did not happen. Uh, what we do know, uh, as, as we've studied our own history, is that there is a remarkable intolerance uh, of, e- of equality among people of all races that we've seen, uh, not just in the 1800s, but even with the Brown decision in 1954. The fact that in the state of Virginia, uh, that uh, there were places where whites closed the public schools rather than allow black and white children to go to those schools together. In the state of Mississippi, uh, there were public swimming pools finally open to blacks that had been segregated, and blacks, they closed the swimming pool rather than allowing blacks and whites to go to the same swimming pool. In the state of North Carolina, uh, blacks were beaten in Greensboro uh, trying to get their rights uh, to simply eat at a lunch counter. In the state uh, of Alabama, Uh, John Lewis uh, and so many other civil rights leaders were beaten crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 1965, trying to effectuate basic nonviolent civil rights for all people. In the state of of, uh, Alabama as well, we saw the tragic death of Viola Luizo, one of the white women uh, transporting uh, civil rights workers uh, to a rally, uh, and the Klan uh, murdered her and would have killed them if they could. In the state of Mississippi, we saw Goodland, Schwerner, and Cheney, uh, three civil rights workers, uh, who were killed in Philadelphia, Mississippi in the 1960s, the very same place that Ronald Reagan announced his campaign for presidency in 1980, on that stained ground uh, in Mississippi to talk about uh, serving our country in the place where our country had let down people who were black and white with the deaths of these three young men. That tells us about the vestiges of slavery. And then, even more importantly, when you think about Mississippi uh, as one of the places that Dr. King talked about, and to think about the fact uh, that uh, some of these great uh, civil rights legends uh, saw uh, their lives taken uh, in in their their own community uh, was a sign of the failure that we've had. And finally, when you think about Memphis, Tennessee, April 4th, 1968, Dr. King went there to support garbage workers to keep their jobs. Uh, He was sick, he was tired, uh, but he came anyway. And to 
think that uh, he was so hated for trying to end the vestiges of slavery. He was so despised for trying to bring all of the people together. He was so threatened because he was a voice of power uh, speaking a truth about uh, the, the vestiges of slavery. And to see that assassin's bullet uh, cut through his uh, throat uh, and take off parts of his head uh, at that hotel uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, was where the line was drawn. Uh, you've used violence to take away a man of peace, uh, a man of God, a man of virtue, and it told us that uh, slavery was not over. Its vestiges were alive and well in pockets of this country that kept our people from being able to enjoy uh, some of the great rights of the 21st and 20th and the 19th century. So as we look at these examples uh, of people who have been forced to work without pay, uh, who have been uh, victims of cruel and vicious uh, beatings, uh, of people who have been denied uh, their property and had it stolen and taken away after it was hardly earned, hard, hard, earned through hard work, as we've seen uh, the schools not have the resources uh, when it's trying to uh, educate black children. Uh, as we've seen uh, housing disappear uh, for uh, people of color, uh, as we've seen the jobs disappear, it tells us that we are, as one author said, we are one nation, uh, two societies, uh, they're separate and they're unequal. Uh, it's as clear of inequality as black and white, and that is uh, the vestige of slavery that we have to deal with today. At the same time, uh, there should be civil judgment. You can call them reparations, you can call them restoration, you can call it reconciliation, but there has to be uh, some civil benefit to those who have been victims uh, in an unconscionable and certainly un unlawful uh, act of this involuntary servitude. And it's worse than involuntary servitude. That's a nice word for slavery uh, because these people are not paid. Uh, they receive no benefits, uh, and, and it's one of the uh, dark deep secrets in our country that we have to address. Now, I mean, you didn't, didn't have to do no whipping in this part of the country. Everybody was uh, submissive and dependent and pretty much kind of like now. For I'm sorry, you're dependent and uh, if you have black serving on corporate boards, they can't say anything because you know, this person that he's serving there with, that Caucasian, own the plantation, good friend to the boss man, or a good friend to the banker, the judge. You're always fearful. So it's the same thing as it was back then, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, no different. Not at all. We couldn't get the people living on the plantation to give us the name of the owners, but Glendora Mayor Johnny Thomas gave us the names of many of the prominent landowners in the area. You know, I know the families are better than this. The Gordon Plantation. The Flocks. The McDaniels. The cabins that have been way back. He's probably the only billionaire in this in this part of the country. And he's just three miles from Glendora, but have never seemingly been able to do anything for Glendora. London. Times. Financial Times. Huh? Not one American paper wrote this, huh? Rockchild, he determines what the gold price going to be every morning. Fairfield, they invented law. Rockchild and Fairfield found to have link to slavery, and they got the pictures of the documents they found that link them, and a tremble have gone all over the world. One day, courage invaded May's mind and she proclaimed, enough is enough. After May denounced her masters, she knew that survival meant becoming a runaway slave. Well, uh, like I said, it, sometimes it... ...into the house. And sometimes it would be your turn to feel they won't have somebody to go into that house and tend to them 
white baby. And this particular time, she didn't come for me. I want I want a favor not to go in the house. They wanted my other sister. And my other sister was sick, which they don't allow you to get sick, but I mean, she said she was sick. And she said, Well I just let so I just got to have her. And my sister kept saying she was sick. And so she said, Well, if she's sick, and she has to look around there and I was headed to the town field. They had already gone. We was we had our sight going on to the field. And she said, I want her. And I don't know what happened to me. I don't, because I know I know what I was gonna get beat and probably killed. But I didn't even think about that. But just the way she did it that morning, she said, I want her. So I walked, kept walking, I kept going to the field. And she said, uh, I want you to come 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 to the house with me this morning. And I said, Not so. You know, that was killing ground right there. I said, not so. She says, uh, oh, yeah, you going. And she says, Cain. And my daddy, he raised up. He done laid it at the end of the road. He raised up. She says, I want her. And he looked around me. He said, baby. I said, not so, dead." She hollered to him again, you know, because you, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm too far out of order. That's two times I'm saying not so to Miss So and So, and you don't say this to them. Not even if you ain't on a plantation, you don't say this to none of the white people. And I said not so. So she hollered at the third time. She said. Cain! I did it, take his sack off. Lay it down. He come walking back to the orchard. I was a big girl then. I was pretty good size. I beat. And I looked at him and I said, Daddy, I said, not so. Well, I know that was a killing right there. You don't, you don't say that to your daddy. And you don't say it to me, say I was now, I done refused three times. What I'm going to do? I'm going to get beat by my daddy. I'm going to get beat by them. So I ended up with two killings. So I couldn't even walk. That particular day, I had to crawl out of the woods to the road. Daddy thought if he beat me first, if he get the thing, you know, and whip me, that would keep them from whipping because he knew that was coming, and coming on to him too. He felt like if he were me first, you see I done whooped my child. That's what he told us later, what would happen. If you see I done whooped my child, then you don't have no business hitting my child. But that's not so. You can whip them. They gonna, they gonna give them more than you can. Daddy said, well, we gonna be killed tonight. They gonna kill us for morning. So I remember saying after that, I beat me down on the ground. I said, well, we just have to be killed for a morning. We don't kill us for a morning. We just have to kill us for a morning. Because I just ain't ever doing it no more. So how did you die? You said you cut your head. So they thought I was beat so bad that I couldn't do nothing, but I did. I crawled on my bed. I don't know how far I crawled. But it was a long way, more than a mile, because I know what a mile is now. More than a mile, maybe a couple of miles or more. And it was a white lady and a man in a buggy. And the lady said she seen the bushes on the side of the road. I guess it was sightseeing. 
and I was crawling doing the thing, and she thought I was a dog. She didn't know it was me. She thought I was a dog, and she told her husband, "said It's a dog coming out of that out of that uh, bushes over there." And uh, so, man, t- I didn't see anything. She said, "Yeah, but it's a dog coming out the bushes." I seen the way the bushes said. Let's check on. And so when I come crawling up there, the lady, they had stopped the buggy. And she said, oh, my God. Honey, this ain't a dog. This a person. And she said, what happened? And I told her, I said, well, they wanted me to go in the house. I said, I was going to the field. They wanted me to go in the house this morning. I said, and I just refused to go. I said, I I didn't say I refused because I didn't know the word refuse. But I said, I just didn't go. I didn't go in the house this morning. And she said, come on, honey. They got me to put me up in the booth. And she says, uh, that they'll beat you mighty bad. And I said, yes, ma'am. They sure will. She said, we're going to take you somewhere. We're going to take you somewhere. She said, uh, that you can do better. She brought me to another plantation. She was nice. It was better. But it was still a plantation. So she give she says, uh that's so what I told her, I said, My daddy, they're gonna be killed tonight. And she said, They gonna kill your daddy then? I said, Yes, ma'am. They they gonna kill everybody. And she says, don't you worry about that. Don't you worry about that. And when it got night, they came back to that place where they carried me, give me to them people, and they said, come on, we're going back. Out. Where we pick you up at. And we're going to see, can we find your dead? We went back out there. And they hollered and hollered for dead in them. They never did answer. They didn't say a word. And so the lady, she said, told me, she said, maybe if he hear your voice, he answer, because he might think we are the people's coming back to do him something. So finally, I was hollering, hollering low, and, and dead was up on the, got some bushes all of me, got up under some bushes, had limb up on top of them in the hay and stuff. And they found every one of them. They found my mama, they found my daddy, and my six brothers and sisters. And they brought them on, they brought us on our camp to that plantation. Now, it was much better. It wasn't good, but it was much, much better than the one that we were there. Uh, they got a few beatings, but nothing like the beating we was getting every day or stuff like that, you know, because we was everybody was getting put four or five times a day for nothing. Just getting beat, I guess just because we were black. They just they just beat but they beat the white folks too now. It wasn't just us getting beat. I remember they had some white folks over there and I remember their name was uh, Williams. And they were beating them folks just like they beat us. It was people on the phone. They was beating them just like they were doing us. My auntie got us off of that plantation. Uh, she married a man from Alabama or something. I believe a man from Alabama. She married some man. And uh, then she found out that my daddy was still alive and wasn't too far in the neck of the woods from around where she was. And they came, got us, and hope us got a place to live. How can this be? Well, that is the question. How can this happen? And you have certainly some people who own these uh, large plots of land who I'm sure have a pretty handsome pr- profit margin when they're getting labor for next to nothing. So if they can get cheap labor or zero labor, then that's a good thing for them, and so they're probably just enhancing their bottom line. And it's sad to think that in this day and time that we'd have people so bent on the bottom line 
that they don't even think about the conditions that people are living under and how they're treating these people. And the story, for instance, that the lady talked about uh, her mother being raped, her being raped, and to think that there are people who think they have the license to do this type of thing to human beings, it's really chilling, to put it mildly. Last question. Do you think that there is a connection with some of the owners of all of that vast amount of land and the Senate Capitol Hill? I would dare say, and I, I hesitate, it's not a total stretch to say that some of them would probably tell you that they're good, loyal Republicans. They probably were good supporters of Fred Lott and maybe Mr. Stennis years ago and uh, on and on, and they would tell you that they're very loyal political participants. So, yeah, I think there is a connection, and I think that if I were to go in there and ask, say, Gene Taylor or some of these other congressmen from that area what they think, I think you probably find that some of them, these are their constituents. And so they need to put these people in line somehow, and at least surprise them with the fact that you can't go around treating individuals like this, not in 2009. So I think that your question is very pertinent, and I think it's one that needs to be addressed, once again, on, on the highest levels of government. Slavery needs to end today for good. We know about the Emancipation Proclamation, but apparently there are some people who didn't get the memo. So we need to let everyone know that the days of slavery should be over, and we want them to be over. Which brings us to the bigger question. Uh, we have made some progress here. Uh, I salute uh, the election of uh, my mentee, uh, President Barack Obama, who was a student here at this law school uh, about 25 years ago, uh, and uh, his wife, uh, Michelle Robinson Obama, who was here a little bit earlier uh, and also graduated. Uh, that's a sign of progress. And yet at the same time, uh, I think about the fact that uh, it was just seven years ago in 2003 that I went to Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, and gave what was called the Buck Colbert speech at the University of uh, Tulsa Law School. Uh, and it was in honor of Buck Colbert Franklin, who was um, John O. Franklin's father. Uh, and the Buck uh, Colbert uh, Franklin lecture, they talked about the issue of reparations. Uh, and after that meeting, I was invited to meet with a group of uh, people at something called the Greenwood Cultural Center. And I went into this room and I saw these black men and women, some blind, crippled, wheelchairs, canes, and I asked, who are you? And they said, we are the Tulsa Race Riot survivors. These were black women and men who were children and 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who were children when Tulsa, Oklahoma was known as the Black Wall Street. Theaters, hotels, prosperity, everywhere you looked, who were part of a rich, segregated, uh, vibrant black community. Uh, and they told about the travesty of being kids uh, and how a young black boy by the name of Dick Rowland uh, had been falsely accused uh, of assaulting a young white girl, Sarah Page, uh, in an elevator uh, in Tulsa. Uh, and in fact, uh, the good news is that uh, the charges against this young man were dismissed because there were no basis to charge him. The bad news is that when whites heard that a black man had allegedly raped a white woman or assaulted a white woman, they went down to the jail. They wanted to lynch Dick Rowland right there on the spot. He was saved by some black men who were World War I veterans and said, we're not going to let you lynch this young boy. He deserves to be heard and have a trial. Uh, and a fight broke out between the blacks and the whites there. Uh, the blacks were outnumbered. Uh, they fought valiantly. They ultimately went back to their community, Greenwood. And these children told the story of their parents and grandparents uh, who had tried to save a black man from a, a unlawful lynching uh, in 1921, and the whites were then given the power through the sheriffs there uh, to go to the pawn shops and the gun shops and to get guns and, as he said then, go get those niggas. They went to Greenwood. They burnt down the Stratford Hotel, a beautiful hotel uh, that blacks had used for great entertainers and others to come to Tulsa. They burnt down the Dreamland Theater, where some of our great performers of the 20th century would come and perform in Tulsa. They burnt down churches, and then they didn't stop there with the businesses. They burnt down the individual homes. They burnt down the entire green black community. Finally, in the year 2007, uh, when the Democrats took over the House of Representatives, 
Congressman John Conyers introduced a bill to give the survivors of the 1921 race riot an opportunity to be heard in court. And our reparations claim is alive because of the efforts, the political efforts of the members of Congress to keep it alive. The President, who has said he's not for reparations, but he's for health care and housing and education and employment, is what we're for. Because when we talk about reparations, we're talking about not just giving everyone a check. We're talking about giving the black community the power to be lifted up from the bottom to a place where they should be if there had not been slavery, if there had not been Jim Crow segregation, if there had not been race riots like the one not only in Greenwood, Oklahoma, but in Rosewood, Florida, and in Greensboro, North Carolina, and in Chicago and other parts of the country. And this reparations, this repair, this making the ground level and equal is part of an ongoing struggle. And we're talking about reparations that doesn't just give checks, but talks about a trust fund for those who are descendants of the slaves who gave their lives and their blood and sweat and tears for this country. And why is this reparations movement so important and why are we advocating for it now even with the black president? Here's why it's important. If you think about the fact that slaves were responsible for building the White House, but you don't see any acknowledgment of their role in any exhibition of the White House. If you think about Congress and the Capitol, slaves used their energy to build the Capitol, the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, and yet where is the acknowledgment of the thousands of people who helped make this country's capital, its form of government, its national buildings, its historical landmarks part of our society. You don't see it, you don't hear it, you don't know it. They are faceless, they are voiceless, they are powerless, and the reparations movement is to repair that past, to give credit to those who spent centuries making this country what it is. So the reparations movement is not about a color or a person, but it's about correcting history. The same way we corrected the history of interning, replacing the internment camps, hundreds of thousands of Japanese Americans in the Second World War, and it took us until 1988 with both Republican and Democrat support for people like Senator Daniel Inouye from Japan and Senator Bob Dole from, not from Trump, from Hawaii, and Senator Bob Dole from Kansas, a Democrat and Republican, to come together as veterans of the Second World War and pass the 1988 Civil Liberties Act to give reparations to the Japanese Americans and to make sure it didn't happen again. We need that same kind of unified, bipartisan effort to correct the harm of slavery, to remember the past, to address it in a meaningful way, and to make sure that these gifts are given to those who have been victims of slavery then and for the families who continue to suffer. And so now what needs to happen is we need to organize behind this and come to D.C. and say we'd like to meet with Eric Holder. We'd like to get a commitment from him. Every state, there will be an investigation. And don't tell me about no more. You'd be shocked to find out. You see, one day black folk are going to be shocked when they find out more black men got lynched over black women than white women. I mean, what kind of work do you do? I don't know. I don't know. Just sit around the house. Yeah. It was hard to believe, even seeing it, it was still hard for me to believe until they told me off camera. On camera, they wouldn't explain uh, everything, you know, that was going on. But off camera, they told us, hey, this, this, is, what's, this is what it is. You know, we've been through a different things from being raped and they told us a lot of different